Lighthouse Nation, what's up? What's going on? So glad that you was able to join us for this Lighthouse Online experience. Hey, listen, if you're on Facebook, start a watch party. If you're on YouTube, share the link. If you're on our app, stay there. But we want to get started right now in worship, and we're so excited to have you. I'm going in right now. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in him. Listen, open up your mouths wherever you are. Instagram, Facebook Live, Twitter, be lifted high, because he's the king of Your name 
Father and our God, we thank you today, God. You said in your word, if you be lifted up, you would draw all men unto, unto you. So God, we thank you that we are gathered here in this church. We are gathered in our homes. We're gathered, God, in our living rooms. And we pray, God, that your spirit may rest, rule, and abide. Lord, we thank you, God, that you're opening up signs for us and wonders. You're bringing miracles to our households. And so, God, we pray today, God, for all of those who are at home that still may have a need, God, for you are able to meet every need. We thank you, God, that you're tearing down the strongholds of abuse. We thank you, God, that you're tearing down the strongholds of mental anguish. We, we thank you, God, that you're tearing down even the strongholds of financial turmoil. For, God, you, you are bringing us to our expected end. So, God, we thank you, God, that you're bringing peace to us. And, Lord, even in a pandemic, God, God, even in a panic, teach us how to pivot, God. Teach us how, God, to use what you are allowing to happen to us as fuel for our future. God, we thank you, God, that you're giving us insight and instruction, witty ideas and inventions. We thank you, God, that even as we focus, God, on ourselves and, and introvertedly seek after you, God, for our own internal things that we are dealing with, God, we know that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly of all that we can ask or think according to the same power that works in us. So, God, give us power to succeed, God. Give us power to travail, God. Give us power. Give us renewed strength in the name of Jesus. So come after this, God. We'll be stronger. After this, God, we'll be wiser. After this, God, we'll have more knowledge, God. And, Lord, we thank you, God, that you're raising us up because you're high and lifted up. You're bringing us up out of minuscule algae, God. You're bringing us out of a low place, God. And you're taking us to higher dimensions, higher revelations, God. We thank you, God, that if we can't find it by revelation, We'll find it by situation. And God, even in the situation that we are in right now, God, you're doing great wonders for us, God. You're bringing us out and we proclaim, God, that you are high and that you are lifted up. Come on and give God praise right where you are.
So we're so grateful uh, to God for the ability to service our community. If you are in the greater Houston area, uh, it is our honor to serve you. Uh, and we're so grateful that God has put us in a position to do it. Now we're getting ready uh, to give you an opportunity to give. And your gifts, I say it every week, your gifts gift us the opportunity to make sure that there's always meat in the house. 2,800 meals is an expensive proposition. But your exchange, your communication, you digging down, you know, whether you are a member here or uh, an online member or you just uh, give because you know it's right to do so. Everything that you're doing right now is helping us to make such a difference in the world. So please continue to do so. I ask that you would dig down deep. I'm going to tell you the three ways that you can give today. Number one, you can go to our website and you can go to at lhhouston.church. Number two, you can text to give at 832-924-0443. Number three, you can go into the Android market or the app store and download our app. And it's TLHC, and you can give that way. So the three ways, go to our website, lhhouston.church. Text to give, 832-924-0443. Or you can download our app, TLHC. And to all of you all who live in the greater Houston area, who have still come by the physical location and drop your tithes and offering off, we thank you so much. We could never do any of the things that we're doing without you. And we thank God that you remain faithful in a famine. And I pray that God will continue to open up the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing Listen to the vernacular, a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. I am predicting and yet even prophesying that God is going to give a gift that will be so large that you won't have room to contain it. You're going to have to share it because there is grace that is getting ready to abound on your account. So as our custom is here, we always like to stand. And I know you may be at home, but I want you to get up. I mean, you may be in the bed right now, but I want you to get up. You may be at the, the, the bar at the kitchen counter, but I want you to stand up. You may, you may even be just walking around the house trying to clean and listen to me at the same time. I want to arrest your attention because I'm getting ready to make an emphatic statement that I believe that this seed is going to protect you until God gets things back in order. And I pray that your finances will not wither and that they will not dry up, that God is going to continue to pour on you and your family a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. So I want you to take that phone or whatever apparatus you're getting ready to use to give your gift. And I want you to repeat after me, as I move towards greater, I will accept all divine ideas, thoughts, and concepts that will connect me to my destiny. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, or will do to me. And because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. If you believe it, I want you to shout in your house, in your automobile, and in your office. God is getting ready to do a new thing. In my life, be glorified. Be glorified in my life. Be glorified. Be glorified. Y'all help me sing it. Yeah. My life. Be glorified.
you for healing my family. Listen, we're going to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read one verse for you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Well, you know what? All right, guys, back it up. Let's go to verse 30. I might not even cover it. I just want to hear it. For we know him that hath said, vengeance, I'm even going to preach it, I just wanted to hear it. (laughs) Belongs to me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Do me a favor, touch your name and say, you can't judge me. Because I ain't yours. Yeah. People always trying to judge you and don't do nothing for you. Don't pay and bill. Ain't yours. He said, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So you 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 got the you got the twi- you ain't supposed to be afraid of them. You supposed to be afraid of I'm gonna preach on verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated ye endured a great fight of affliction. Do me a favor. Prophesy to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I know you are up against the fight of your life. But God told me to tell you, don't back down. That's that's what I want to talk about. High five three people on your way down to your seat and tell them, don't back down. Don't back down. Don't back down. Don't back down. Devil, you done messed up. Don't back down. It is incumbent upon me before I give you the antithesis of my discussion that I give you the introduction from the place of exposition. 
I will repeat it because as a minister, I was always taught if it wasn't worth saying twice, then you shouldn't have said it once. That the book of Hebrews uh, is an epistle that was constructed, but we do not know who the author is. Some suggest that because of the linguistics, that it is possibly the Apostle Paul. I've even heard some say that there are so many who could have done it that it is best not to even guess. Even though we are not privy to God's thoughts as it relates to whose pen touched this paper, although we are not sure who wrote it, we are absolutely sure what they were writing about. When you look at this chapter that we're discussing, the, the author uses the entirety of the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews to express to us through exposition about the sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And that it is important for those of us who subscribe to the Christian faith that no matter what the circumstance is, that we always subscribe to faithfulness and making sure that you never give up. Somebody say endure. He, he wants us to have so much faith that he doesn't want it delayed. Just one chapter later, he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it is the evidence of what? Things not seen. The writer uses every verse of the 10th chapter to let us know that he's putting an old argument to rest. And that old argument is, is that there was an annual yearly law sacrifice that was necessary for the propitiation or the atonement of mankind. That is to suggest that every year on the Day of Atonement, there had to be a lamb slain in the tabernacle beyond the holies of holies by the high priest and only he could go in once a year and if he went any other time other than the day of atonement the glory of God was so thick that it would kill him on sight once a year he would atone for all of the sins of Israel it was a repetitious annual yearly sacrifice but then the writer of Hebrews says, I want to put to rest that old argument because we're no longer under the law. We are now under what is called the grace of God. And he says, there is no longer the necessity of an annual sacrifice because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was slain according to Isaiah before the foundation of the world, was slain on the cross and now has put an end to the annual sacrifice because he is so whole and so perfect that he did it once and it was finished. See, what most people have to realize is that when Jesus Christ was on the cross and he said, it is finished, he was not talking about his suffering. He was talking about ours. <laughs> Do you get that? He said, it is finished. And, and then he finishes off by saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And when he held his head in the locks of his shoulders and gave up the Holy Ghost, he now has done something no other being can do. It's because now he is God who created man, but he also became men so that those of us who knew sin would not we would not, watch this, be the benefactors of the damnation of our actions. Because in every one of us, there is something called a man nature, a deprived nature, a nature that has an attraction to sin. So he who knew no sin, y'all going to stay with me, became sin so those of us who are sinners could actually be called the righteousness of God. And now he is the only being who is now sitting at the right hand of the Father who can now say that he is the only being who is both priest and king 
because there were some priests who were not kings and some kings who were not priests. You see, Eli was a priest, but he was not a king. Samuel was a priest, but he was not a king. Nebuchadnezzar was a king, but he was not a priest. Are you with me so far? So Jesus Christ, when he dies on the cross and sheds his blood, now takes the only position that, that can ever be filled, and he now sits at the right hand of the Father, both priest and king, which is baffling because he is the Father, which means he's sitting next to himself. <laughs> He's sitting next to himself. He needs nobody else. He needs no assistance. He needs no crutch. He needs no addendums. He needs no help. Besides him, there is no other. He is God all by himself. He is self-sufficient, all-knowing. He is omniscient and I'm not present. And I don't know about you, but my, one of my favorite portions of Scripture says he's a very present help. Somebody say he's a very present help in the time of a storm. Hebrews chapter 8 then comes behind and solidifies the perspective that the law now is no more written on stone. Remember, the Bible says that Moses went up to the mountain and he had, he had inscribed the law on two sets of stones, got upset and got angry and then broke it and God made him redo it. See, look at the law having to be redone. It was broken and then it had to be redone. But, but you never see Christ having to go back to the cross because his work is salvific and it doesn't have to be redone. I wish I had a church. So that's why the writer says now the word of God, the law is no more written on the tablets. The, the law is now written on the hearts of men. That's why David said in Psalms 119, thy word have I hidden in my heart that, when I, that, that I might not sin against thee. Somebody say the word is written on the heart. But now we've got a problem because now that the word has gone from the stones and now it's gone to the heart, sin has come into the world and presented itself to make sure that our nature never arrived to its destiny. And here is what I want you to understand today, that anytime you are in the, the, the track, anytime you are in the vein, anytime you're on the progress of getting to where God wants you to get, and every time he gives you a word, listen, the devil will always send a system or an attack that will assault the word that God gave you for your life. Do I have any witnesses in here today? Have, raise your hand if God has ever given you a word for your life. I am here to announce to you today that whenever God gives you a word for your life, the devil will send something that will assault that word. Why? Because men have a tendency not to believe that which is not giving tangible evidence in the moment of crisis. So that means that when you are suffering, when you are going through, this is when we want to see that God is real. But sometimes in the struggle, God sits back and to see if you will trust him or results. <laughs> Y'all not listening. See, you want God to end it. God says, no, I'm using this thing to draw out of you what I put inside of you. I'm using this thing. Help me, Holy Ghost. It might be like salt, but it's drawing out blood. It might be pain, but it's drawing out purpose. It might be hurt, but it's drawing out help. It might be down, but it's drawing out up. I don't know who's going through in here today, but David told me to tell you that every once in a while, you ought to say it was good that I was afflicted because that affliction has kept me from getting an infection. Oh, God, help me. Is there anybody in the room today that is in the month of January in the year 2020 saying to yourself, I did not think this year was going to start off like this. I had no idea the devil was going to attack me on this level, in this area, through this individual. But God sent me to tell you today, don't you back down because he who has began that thing is going to bring it to completion. Give your neighbor a high five and say, don't back down. So now we get to verse 29. Now we get to verse 29. The law was written on tablets. Now it is written on what? The hearts. Now sin presents itself. Now see, here's the thing about sin. Everybody's, everybody's trying to, to ascertain perfection. You're, you're not going to get there. Okay? You're not going to get there. Are you, are you with me? Now, the fact that we're no longer under the law doesn't mean that we must ignore it. Because the law is no longer on tablets. The law is on the heart. 
which means now we have what's called conviction. Conviction means that the good that I would do, I'm, I'm trying, but I don't quite get there. But just because I don't get there doesn't mean I don't try to get there. See, here's the problem with grace. It has so anesthetized some of us that we think we can do whatever we want because it's covered. But Jesus says, I got a problem with that because to every man is given a measure of grace. So you cannot sin and do whatever you want just because grace abounds because you don't know how much grace you have in your account. God help me in this church today. Just do me a favor, slap your name and say, you can't do what you want to do. But if you do, it's covered. Help me, Holy Ghost. Now, now here, here is what he wants us to know, that the law is written on our hearts. And now we are all fallen, depraved men. I know you sit next to They think they're better than you, but they ain't. Just, I don't care how much money they make. I don't care where they got their degree from. I, I, don't, I, don't care, I don't care what neighborhood they live in. I don't care what car they drive. They, they think because they purse better than yours that they better than you. They ain't better than you. Touch on them and say, you ain't no better than me. I don't care, I don't care what the color of the bottom of your shoe is. I don't, I don't care if it's black, red. You, you ain't nothing but dirt and red bottoms. That's the truth. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know why people think they better. You no, know, it's, if it's one thing I can't stand, it's people who think they better than other people. I, I can't stand it. I don't, care. I don't care how many languages you can speak. You can still go to hell talking in tongues. Help me, Holy Ghost. I, I, don't, care. I don't care how light-skinned you are. I don't care how dark-skinned you are. I don't care how fine you are. I don't care if you got baby hair without water. I don't care, I don't care. I don't care who you are. You can still get it. Slap your neighbor and say, you can still get it. I don't care how smooth your skin is, if you use olive oil, lay Neutrogena, I don't care what kind of cream you got, I don't care if you use Nivea or some of us use Dial, I don't care how much your soap costs, you might got Dove, I got Irish Spring, it don't matter because we're still dirt. People think they better because they shampoo is nice, and they think they better because they got Sirius XM radio in the car, and some of us still clicking and dialing. Some of y'all worried about somebody stealing your car. Some of y'all car so raggedy, you hope they steal it. How many of y'all just, I hope they come and get this thing so I can. Just, you be leaving it in the middle of the street with the keys in the car, with the door open, come back tomorrow like, dang, didn't nobody take it? I'm t I guess. <laughs> God says that when we sin as if we're not aware of who he is, Listen, don't, go, don't get sleepy. It says, according to verse 29, that we have trampled on the Son of God. Thereby making the blood common and insulting grace. Oh, God, help me. See, this is, this is real preaching because everybody wants to hear, oh, give your neighbor a high five and, and tell them everything's going to be all right. But God says, you keep acting a fool. Everything ain't going to be all right. You have trampled on the Son of God. You have taken the power from the blood, and you have made grace a mockery. This is, this is verse 29. Are you with me so far? So I wanted to read that because everybody wants to talk about vengeance is mine, but you cannot get the vengeance if you are making God a mockery. God is not going to fight on your behalf if you're not on his team. God is not going to fight for you if you are not fighting for the right thing. He says you have, you have, you have trampled on, on, on God himself. You have made the blood common, and you have made a mockery out of grace. See, the enemy understands that he can send a situation that will get us off of our destiny. How many of you are going through that right now? It, it, you, if you reacted to what you were going through, you'd be way off of your track. Who, this, who am I? 
Could you ask your neighbor if I'm talking to them because they ain't said nothing yet. Just ask, could you ask them? And the enemy will assault the very nature of the word that God has put in your life. The enemy will make you think that you did not hear what you heard. He will make you start to question whether or not you actually have favor and glory on your life. The enemy will have you looking in the mirror saying, you know, and this is how church attendance starts to decrease because you start to think, well, he don't love me. He don't care about me. He's not thinking about me. I can go whenever I want to, but slap your neighbor and tell him the devil is a liar. The reason we wonder, write this down, the reason we wonder if the word works is because it, it is not, and I'm going to repeat it, it is not producing tangible evidence while we're suffering. When it's not happening when you want it to happen, you start believing it ain't happening. And then the scripture says his ways are not what? And his thoughts are not what? So that means that God never works when you think he should. Because if God is working when you think he should, then you and him have the same thoughts. He doesn't work when you think it ought to start. He doesn't start when you want it to initiate. He doesn't quit when you think it should be over. He doesn't think like us. He, he's doing a far greater work in our life that sometimes requires us to suffer past our threshold. Sometimes causes us to cry when we feel like we don't have any energy left to do it. And that's when God is starting. Are you with me so far? Now let's get to the text because he says a spiritual fight always occurs when you receive the illuminated plan of God. See, the reason why you went through all of those years with no fight is because you were not close to destiny. How many of you ever wish that you could go back to when things were calm and when things were okay and yeah, but see, if you go back there, you go back to ineffectiveness. See, when, when, when everything was going good, when you were not struggling, when you were not stressed, when you were not uh, full of anxiety, when you didn't struggle to wake up and struggle to go to sleep, when you were not trying to figure out who you could trust and who you couldn't trust, when you, when you wasn't doing all of that, guess what? That was because you were ineffective. Now that you have gotten to the illuminated part, see, watch this. You can be in a room that's filthy and not know it because the lights are off. See, if you ever going to clean the room, you got to turn the lights on. See, let me tell you something about me. I don't like eating in the dark. I need some light. Because people nasty. And I, I want to know, know what's in it. I don't want to find out there was hair in the food once. How many, I look at my food, I, I, like to, I like to eat in the dark. Another thing, you got to clean in the dark, in the light. You got to clean in the light. You can't clean in the dark. You ever go to one of those restaurants and they vacuum in and the lights out like they nasty because you got to have lights on. Come on, help me, Holy Ghost. You got to have lights on. See, see, the problem is, is you're trying to make too many adjustments in night. You're trying to make too many adjustments. So what God does is he brings the spotlight to your life. And guess what? When the spotlight comes and you are illuminated, now you start to see stuff that you should have thrown away. Now you start to see stains that you didn't know that were there. Now you start to see people who should have been excommunicated. God says, I'm bringing the light because now when you get to the illuminated path, this is the most painful part of your life. Why? Because light always shows what existed in darkness. I'm helping somebody. Jeremiah was a great prophet. How many of you know that? And Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, listen, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I had already what? I knew you and called you to be a prophet. To, that's illumination. But, but, but what we did not know is that illumination was going to bring about an argument with another prophet named Hananiah who came and said that after he had put the wooden yokes on the people, he came and then and broke them. And then Jeremiah said to him, you thought you had broken the wooden yokes, but what you have done is turned them into yokes of iron. Because when you break stuff before it's time, <laughs> God help me. 
See, he didn't know that. See, we understand that Joseph would be the prime minister of Egypt. That's illumination. But we didn't know that there was a pit. Everybody's so grateful that David became king. Yes, illumination. But did anybody tell him Goliath was a part of that? And Jesus, the king of the world, the one who sits on the throne, yes, he is the creator of the world, and yes, it is in him that we live, move, and have our being, but not without stripes, not without a cross, not without a crown of thorns, not without being pierced in the side. Everybody wants the illumination, but can you handle the distraction? See, this is where we miss our mark, is because when we're on our crosses, we back down. This is why you never open the business, is because when it gets tough, you quit. This is why you never become an author, is because when you have writer's block, you stop writing. This is why you never become successful is because when it comes illumination time and you find out how much work you have to do and you find out how much paperwork is actually involved in getting that grant, hallelujah, help me, Holy Ghost, you want a grant, you want the government to fund it, but when you find out that you have to do your taxes right and that you got to fill out this paperwork and that you got to get references, see, once it gets difficult, then everybody quits because everybody just wants to go down there and spend $16 and get a DBA and think that you're going to be in business. Yep, yeah, this gonna be a this gonna be a tough one because I can tell right now by looking at some of y'all users. I, I thought it would be easier than that. I'm I'm ready. I'm just ready to be rich. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to be successful. I'm, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to overcome. I'm ready for God to do it. Who cares what you're ready for? Or what are you strong enough for? Are you, are you afraid or will you not back down? Because let me tell you something. If you ever get to the level you want to get at, there are some devils that has as much strength as you have prayer. Help me, Holy Ghost. And if you have the courage to get up there, I'm telling you that the devil has an attack on that level that will make you wish that you stayed where you were. I ain't even got to verse 32 yet because I'm, I'm trying to get y'all ready. You ain't ready for verse 32 yet because some of us as Christians, we just want God to do it. Just do it, God. Do it. Do it, God. God, make me a wife. God, make me a husband. God, I want a child. God, I want a business. God, I want a new car. God, I want a bigger house. And you haven't thought about all that comes. With what you're asking for. God, I want to I want to I want to be an owner. Okay. Let's do it. But there's homeowner association fees. You can't call the maintenance man to fix the air condition. The refrigerator going to go out in about four or five years. The washing machine ain't going to work at the same time as the dryer. The roof is going to leak. The toilet is going to break. And your kids are bad. Now, let's add them in. They're going to put their hands on the wall. They're going to spill stuff on the carpet. And the only one who cared about it was the one who bought it. Now you're going to go in the room and see something that you didn't witness, and now you got to wonder, are they kids or do I go beat them? And now you go to the store, and you say, God, oh, I want this new car, but you didn't account for the person who was going to hit you at Walmart and not tell you. And it'll make you back down. For all these prayer requests up here, I, I, I'm going to walk on them. But have you considered the cost? 
Have you ever thought about what happens if God actually does it? Lord, I want to be a mother. Okay, let's do it. But this is about the next 18 years. Hold on, I ain't finished. Can you, can you let me finish? I'm preaching. You got the next 18 years of them being a child. And then another 40 of them being a kid. And get them 18 to get out of the house. They'll never get out the house. You ain't out of your mama house yet. You still going over there getting a pineapple upside down cake every other weekend. I'm, mama, can you make me some banana pudding? You still ain't out the house. We're in your mama to death. I'm going to preach in a minute. You think Jacob knew he was going to bring Israel together when his hip was out of socket? Could you imagine God using you to bring things together and you not, to, you not together? <laughs> Has, have you ever been used by God to do something that ain't even right in your own life? Oh, don't miss what I just said. God will use you in an area where you're out of socket. And it will make you back down because you'll think because you're not proficient in this area, then you should not be used in this area. But God always used misery to make ministry. And don't you let nobody make you think that because you are not successful in an area that you should not talk about that area. In fact, your lack of success in that area gives you enough strength and experience to talk about that area. Touch two people, say, don't back down. All right. Let's talk about this. Look at verse 32. I'm going to give you three words we're going to talk about 15 minutes and I'll be finished. Thank you. Go to verse 32. Write these three words down, great, fight, and affliction. These are the three words I want to talk about, great, fight, and affliction. Right. Great is a Greek word which means a huge number or to an enormous degree. So great is a Greek word, which means a huge number or to an enormous degree. So but the call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured what? A great fight. So this is a huge fight. The idea is, listen, that every spiritual advantage that you will ever have will also be accompanied by a spiritual attack. Wherever there is a prophecy on your life, significant attack will come in that area. Listen, you are only being attacked in the area where you're dangerous. All of that other part of your life that don't mean nothing to the devil, he's not about wherever you are being attacked, the enemy is letting you know, I perceive you to be dangerous in that area. Every time you get a blessing, you will also get a burden. So, that's what I'm trying to tell y'all because the 31st is coming. If you get this, I want to show you something. If you get this, remember we talk God, is, he does what? So if you get this, understand you're going to get that. So if you cannot handle heavy burdens, you got to stop asking for big blessings. Because there will always be a burden the same size as the blessing. And here's what happens to us. We ask God for all of this stuff. And forget that there are strings attached. 
that every time you get something, the enemy wants to take it. So now that you have something, now you have to deal with the enemy wanting to retrieve that thing back from you. Okay? All right? So you're going to go through what? Great affliction. Are you with me so far? I'm teaching you this morning because I want to help you. Somebody say, help me. So when there is a prophecy on your life, significant attack will come. And the kind of attacks that will make you question your determination towards God. How many of you have ever said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I am i had enough of this church stuff. Just be honest. So you never wanted to give up on it? I know, well, I don't want to turn around on God. I ain't going to turn around on him. Yep, that's good for some of y'all, but some of us be like, you know what? I'm a, let me go on. I'm going to talk to people who like me because the rest, you know, people come in church. See, let me tell you something. The Bible says that we come and we masquerade. See, people come to church and they want to act like they're so holy and like they never felt like giving up or felt like quitting. But sometimes I feel like, see, I can't even say what I want to say right now because we're in the age of the Internet. About 20 years ago, I would have said something right there that I knew y'all wouldn't have been able to repeat. Now, I ain't going to say it. Now, I ain't going to be that foolish. Sometimes you just want to be like the heck with it all. There's a certain group of people that you want to say the heck with, you know? And for those of y'all who are like, no, I just love everyone and I'm, I'm saved and I'm delivered by God and everything is okay and I love the grass and the suns and the trees. Is, I'm, so, I'm so grateful. Just become one with the earth. Some of us will be like, you know what? I ain't going outside today. I don't want to fool them people because somebody say something to me. I've been, I've been looking. I ain't had a fight in 10 years. The next person who say something to me, they're going to get everything that I've been wanting to get. You ain't never said that. The next person I roll up on going to get everything all these jokers didn't get. You be walking around looking for people. What you say? Huh? Oh, hello. Don't say hello again. See what I do to you. <laughs> Speak to me again. Wish me another good day. I'm going to show you it's a good day. You ain't never been that kind of angry. God bless me. What? Bless who? <laughs> it's going to make sense in a minute. <clears throat> What I'm trying to get you to the place of doing is holding on when it's unstable. How many of y'all like roller coasters? Ever got on a roller coaster like I'm going to ride this thing with no hands? Have you ever noticed on the way up? I'm having, oh, because when you go down, you hold on. And the reason why some of y'all are holding on so tight is because you feel like you're going down and you don't understand that there is another loop coming up ahead. If you would just wait on the Lord because he will balance it out, he got to up for every down. Slap your neighbor and say, you got to come back up. Don't you back down because of your money situation. Don't you back down because your heart is broken. Don't you back down because they've been lying on you. Don't you back down because you lost that house. Don't you back down because you lost that job. God has to balance this thing out and it's going to come up again. Somebody shout, don't back down. Don't you back down. Don't you back down. You got it. You. You just hold on. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up. I don't know who I'm, you and your mount up season. I, I know it looks like you're going down, but somebody shout mount up, mount up, mount up. I decree and declare everything in your life is getting ready to go up. I decree and declare everything in your life is on the rise. Give your neighbor a high five and say, I'm about to come up. I'm about to come up. And, I, and I'm about to do it because I didn't back down. I'm about to do it because I didn't quit. I'm about to do it because I did not faint. I'm about to do it because I didn't go back. You understand? 
that the greater you are, the greater your conflict. A champion will not risk his belt on an inferior fighter. Every time the devil picks a fight with you, he's showing you your weight class. If, he was a, if you were a featherweight, he would have sent an imp. But because you are a heavyweight, he came to fight you himself. Great affliction. I hope I'm getting you right. Great, not, not mediocre, not trivial. Like you getting ready to go through some great affliction. So a great fight, a great fight. So great. Number two, the word fight, athlesis in the Greek, where we get our English word athletic, gives the idea of a competition, which means that some of you all probably always feel like you're in the ring. You always feel like you're on some football field in some competition. Every day of your life is a fight. All your life. You got you to gotta fight every night to prove your love. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to join church today because you ain't saved. How many of y'all knew exactly what I was talking about? I extend an invitation to Christian discipleship for the rest of you all who don't know that that is a line out of one of the greatest movies that have ever been made called The Five Heartbeats. And if you don't know nothing about The Five Heartbeats, I'm going to extend an invitation to you today. By the way, lift your hands if you got enough courage. If you have never seen The Five Heartbeats, lift your hands. Yeah, it's a shame. I pity you. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Right now, you ain't got no Holy Ghost. Ain't nothing saved about you if you ain't seen that movie. God be with you until we meet again. Why we're absent one from another. Mm, mm, mm. Uncircumcised generation, the Philistines. Great affliction. You got to be athletic to fight. You have to be in shape to do it. I know you can fight, but are you fit? Because if you can fight and you're not fit, all I got to do is wait on you to swing yourself out. And see, this is what the devil is doing to some of y'all right now. I am on assignment. I know exactly what God told me to do. Right now, some of y'all swinging in the first month. You throwing everything you got. February going to come around. Come third round March, you got nothing left. It's a 12-round fight every year, and most of you all get knocked out in March because you can fight, but you're not fit. You don't study. You don't pray. You don't forgive. You don't pray. Oh, help me. You don't purify your heart, so you get so tired and fed up and angry. By the time March get here, you get knocked out. You got to be fit to fight. You got to be fit to fight. Touch your name and say, you got to be fit to fight. How do you get fit to fight? Number one, you got to be humble. Number two, you got to forgive. Some of you all lose your fights because it takes so much energy to stay mad that by the time it comes fighting the devil, you don't have anything left because you spent all of your energy being angry. You got to be ready to fight, y'all. You in the fight. This ain't no, this ain't no ballet. Life ain't an amusement park. It's a fight. You, you, 
get out of this fairy tale that you're going to wake up and it's going to smell like blossoms and cherries and lilac and lavender and orange juice, cotton candy and no, we got thorns. Lay aside every weight that so easily doth beset you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver him from them all, Psalms 34. See, you got to understand that the more affliction that you go through, the more God is trying to show you that I have a plan for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and I wish that you would be in good health. Do you understand what God is trying to accomplish through what you're going through? And so we don't want to really, most preachers can't preach this stuff anymore because the crowd won't say amen to it. And we, we, can't, we can't do it because, see, when you start preaching like this, everybody starts worrying about if the parking lot is going to be full, and so they leave early, and, and, and they start wondering about whether they're going to be in the line for brunch on time. You, you'd be amazed at when the word starts to convict you like this, how, how busy people's minds become, and, and how all of a sudden they start to wonder and think about other stuff, and they want to know why the devil keep knocking them out. It's because they always want to show up for the fight, but they want to sleep during training. Help me, Holy Ghost. See, you, you want to sleep. You want to sleep during the substance, but you want to wake up when it's game time. That's why you're always pulling a hamstring. That's why you come up limp, and that's why you're always limping. Why? Because when you don't work hard. And right now, while you need to be alert, you're sleepy. That's why you get knocked out. I'm showing you right now how he swings. I'm showing you right now where his uppercut is coming from. I'm trying to show you right now that this is a great fight. So if it's a great fight, you can't undertrain. If it's a great fight, you can't be playing around. This ain't the time to be missing in action. This is not the time for you not to pray. This is not the time for you not to open your Bible. This is not the time for you not to be fasting. This is not the time to miss the prayer revival. This is not the time. This is the time to show up and say, devil, you done messed around and came up against me while I have the knowledge of knowing that I am in a great fight and I'm only preaching to people who are determined to win. If you are determined to win, give your neighbor a high five and say, I am not going to sleep through this tragedy. I'm not going to sleep through this trial. I'm going to wake up every day and I'm going to look the devil in the eye and let him know that I am a child of God and that my daddy is both priest and king. Help me, Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slap three people and say, fight back. Yes. Say it again, fight back. Yes. Don't you lay down and take this one with your eyes closed. This ain't the time to watch this is not just a time to pray, but the Bible says watch, fight, and pray. And I don't know about you, but this is fighting season. I give you authority to smack the devil in his mouth. I give you authority to step on his head and take back what he has taken from you. Oh, somebody shout, take it back. Let me let y'all out of here. Finally, we come to the third word, which was what? Affliction, the Greek word pathema, which means mental pressure. So this is what the devil is dealing with you in your mind. And I guarantee you right now, some of you all don't know it because you think this is a physical assault. Your back ain't hurting because your back hurting. Your back hurting because your mind messed up. You don't have back pain. You got, I can't release. You, your heart, there's nothing wrong with your heart, but there's something wrong with your heart. You, you don't have acid reflux. You're just too mean to digest. That's, that's why the medicine ain't working. Here you are taking Prilosec and you got a spiritual issue. You cannot get a prescription for a spiritual attack. Oh, I wish I had a church. That's why the Advil ain't working. That's why the Tylenol doesn't work. We wrestle not against flesh and blood.
That's why you got to keep getting stronger medication, and then you get something that's strong, and then you think, oh, it's working. No, it just has you out of it so you don't know what you're going through. And every time the medicine wears off, you get right back to the same level of pain. You can do your little yoga do all you want to. You still ain't got no peace. Going to get your little smoothies, the green ones. I mean, I'm going to live. You're going to have a good liver and a bad heart. The healthiest person to ever die. You're fighting with the wrong thing. Okay, how many ibuprofen you take? And I'm not saying this to be facetious, nor am I saying this to be salacious. But they will, they will any scientist will tell you that a woman's menstrual cycle is made worse by her mental state. There are women who have menstrual cycles right now have no cramps. Your cramps are connected to your meanness. And the more pain you have inside of you, the more pain you feel. I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's researchable. You can go read it yourself. When your cramps got you bent over, if you don't have some debilitating disease, it's because you got a mental issue that makes you mean, and it, it's called a pain body, and it reacts during menstruation. Read a book called The Power of Now, and then come and holler at your boy. Tell him, you ain't no woman you don't know, but I know how to read. There are women right now, they have, menstrual, they have their menstruation like no pain. Two, three days, they're done. Some of y'all have to go to the morgue every seven days. Just, just mean. Take a whole bottle of Advil every month. I don't care about you looking at me like that. You don't know what he's talking about. My mama had it too. She was mean too. It's hereditary. What's the disease called? Cramps? You are in a spiritual battle. And you better not back down. You better not lose. If you lose, I ain't going to talk to you. We grew up in a house. You just, you couldn't get beat up in our house. You can't, we couldn't ever lose a fight because if we lost, we had to, my, my, uh, <laughs> well, there's always tomorrow, son. We couldn't lose a fight. If we lost, we got whooped again for losing. You better win. Did you hear me? I said you better win. Don't back down. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Finish everything you started. Cry and keep going. Get off your knees, get on your feet, and keep marching. Keep your head up, keep your hands on guard, keep your heart pure, and keep your mind stayed on Jesus. And I want to tell about 500 of you today, God already told me this, the victory is already yours. Give three people a high five and say, the victory is yours. Come on, somebody tell them the victory is yours. Don't you surrender to the enemy's vision of you. Don't you surrender to what they say about you. Don't surrender to what your mind tells you about yourself. 
you shall live and not die. If you believe it, I dare you to open up your mouth and give him glory. Stand to your feet. Don't you settle for what the enemy has said about your finances. Don't you settle for what the enemy has said about your body. I'm sick. Stop, profess stop proclaiming that and stop professing that. I got the, you fill it in. You ain't got nothing. It got you. Cancer can skip a generation if you don't back down. My mother's mother died of cancer two months before my oldest sister was even born. My mother doesn't have to succumb to what her mother came to. You got to understand that there's an attack coming. Yesterday, I'm on a plane. I'm landing back. My sister calls me. I know that if she called me, it's something serious because they normally text me. She called me. I'm on the plane. I can't answer. I said, what's wrong? She says, our cousin just committed suicide. But my mom, she's calling me, and she says, what are you doing? I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm on my way home. Then I go to pick the baby up, and she called me again. You on your way home? Yeah, woman. That's why I'm on my way home. <laughs> and she said, you want me to ride with you? I'm like, okay, something ain't right. I'm 38 years old. My mama don't want to ride with me nowhere because I ain't going to no beauty parlor. I ain't going to get no nails done. I ain't going no place she want to go. She used to take us to a store called Learner. I couldn't, I can't, I can't, I can't go there anymore. <laughs> New York and company, I can't, I can't, I have sat in there so many hours of my life that when I see the store, I get anxiety. I, I, I can't go there anymore. I didn't know why. She keeps asking me this, and she comes and she says, oh, you know, man, it's my cousin. She said, you know, he was going through a divorce, and he hung himself. So now I know why she keeps calling me, because her sister just lost her son. Now she's worried about losing hers. But I can't even tell her, I ain't backing down. What? 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 You, you just touch your name and say, don't back down. You, you don't have to die from what they died from. You don't have to go down like they went down. It ain't even a thought. I killed somebody else before I killed me. I'm just being honest now. I don't mean it. I ain't going to do nothing, but I, that, that would be my option. I'm not going to kill me. Why would I do that? I like me. A lot. Everybody all scared. I want to talk about stuff. Like, you can't help nobody being scared of your story. I faced you every week. Sundays and Tuesdays. It's a great fight. It's a great affliction. God says, don't worry because I've overcome the world. And you shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. God, today, we put the devil on notice that we will not back down, that we will stand tall, that we will stand firm, and that we will see what the end is going to be. We will die when you say it's over. We will live until you say it's done. And God, we stand boldly as a congregation, and we say to the enemy that we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, 
and we believe that all things are working together for our good. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, shout amen. Hug somebody on your way out. Tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. I'll see you Tuesday. Wow. That blessed me. And I hope you did the same for you at home or in your car or wherever you may be watching this. But most importantly, we want to give you the opportunity to sow into this ministry. And you can do that three ways. You can do that by text, you can do that online via website, or you can also download our app right there below the screen. And also, if you want to give your life to Christ, or you want to be a part of this ministry, or you basically want to get back realigned and you realize that this message has really given you a transparent view of your life, we want you to connect with us by texting LH Nation to 84576. That's LH Nation to 84576. Seven six. We want to hear from you. We have people waiting to connect with you.